So everyone on the internet is telling me that Photomechus can be syncretized with all these other spirits, you know, Hermes, St. Expedite, and so on. Anyone who goes fast. And what I want from them is a sequel to the Fast and Furious franchise where The Rock is The Rock that smashes the clocks. Um, Vin Diesel can... <laughs> Vin Diesel can be the drummer <laughs> that's used in one of the, one of the rituals uh, that Fenwick ended up uh, writing, and um, and and the Chronomancer from the same ritual is Photobicus. This will all make sense later in the episode. Uh, I I hope it makes sense immediately uh, because of the Rock's crucial role in this narrative, as it always is, right? I've never seen any of those movies, by the way, but I just I like the puns and the names. And I like I like the knowledge that if you watch the first movie and then watch the last one and nothing in between, you can like you have to hallucinate what happens in between because suddenly <laughs> they go from just driving really quickly to like physically throwing cars and like being able to perform superhuman feats of strength. Um, I was told this, okay? Like, I'm not I'm not saying that I know this for a fact, but I would like a Too Fast, Too Furious, Photomakers Forever film magic. That should have been the real film magic. Um, for real, yeah. Yeah, Chronomancer film. I, I would really like to be driving down the highway one day mm -hmm. and then for Photomakers... Not in like an anthropomorphic form, just as like the little sigil with arms. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Be driving a car next to me and seeing <laughs> starts loudly playing over the radio from both cars. It's about family. <laughs> 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 oh god, yes. Uh, well, you know, he started off as a sigil, allegedly, right? And then eventually became a servitor, and then in chaos magic parlance, apparently, he eventually became an egregore. And now possibly eventually became a deity. I, I do like this Pokemon evolution that like a lot mm -hmm. of Chaos Magic texts seem to invoke, where it's like Servitor evolves into Egregore, which evolves into <laughs> oh sorry, you know, Sigil evolves into Servitor and then to Egregore and then to God. But you know, my bone to pick with that aside, um, you gave us a great DKM episode. And I, I said in the episode that the only real magic that I've messed around with that's chaos adjacent or a part of that tradition specifically uh, besides just sigils as like a thing that I tried a few times um, is Photomechus as a spirit. Uh, one that I have called and conjured and used very regularly actually I might add. Like this is this is uh, the whole arsenal of techniques involving him. Um, there, we'll, we'll get into like my specific experiences at the end, but like he is one that I've actually called fairly regularly and still do, and has been amazing. Like for for getting on time, for getting the bus to stop when I'm running late, and I see on my app that it's like coming in one minute, and it takes me two minutes to get to the stop, you know, and like, uh, you know, it'll just it'll slow down the everything will will we be perfect, you know. I I love him. He's great, and I want to do him justice. So since you gave us a Chaos Magic episode, and uh, Salt's not back today, but he, uh, he will be for the next one, for episode thirteen, uh, I I decided we're gonna we're gonna do Mister Fast and Mister Furious. Mm -hmm. uh, you're Miss You're Mister Furious, by the way, in this in this equation, Key. Excellent. So uh, yeah, a, a position where I often find myself. I like it. Yeah, it's like the play play the you know Siri. Please play the Berserker Noise soundtrack that you that you have on hand, of course. <laughs> hey Siri, why are there wolf noises coming from outside of my apartment? Yeah, yeah, precisely, yeah. precisely. Uh, hey Siri, why are you down? Why are you downloading a bootleg copy of the Northman? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. All right. Like let us. Guy. Yeah, he is a good guy. Let us. Let us give a little. Let's give some praise, if you will, to Mr. Timey Wimey, Wobbly Wobbly <laughs> himself. Mm -hmm.
alarmed at the frightful howls which you may hear. It's uh, yours truly, Sphinga, and Broken Clock Key, uh, mm -hmm. because the rock hath smashed him. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> this is why you're furious. Oh, man. <laughs> yeah, we... <laughs> Cultivate my my revenge arc against uh, against the Rock. Yeah, to literally. best him in single combat. Oh yeah. To be honest, I I could actually see that being a long term magical goal for you. Uh, <laughs> you 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 being the gym rat that you are, and like also the martial arts nerd that you are, it's just like fight me, Dwayne. I know a screamer. <laughs> Legit. I'm like put on the ceremonial garb that you wore in that Nickelodeon special back in the day that pissed off my, like, fundamentalist aunt and uncle for doing pagan <laughs> rituals in a children's TV show. Let's fucking go. I love that so much. The Rock is your Egregor. Uh He's your Tulpa. Uh, <laughs> yeah. that, just lives, that just lives in, in, in your mind, and you fight him in your simulation room. Like, when you're meditating, and it's just, like, a spirit body version of you sparring, like Neo from the Matrix. Um, that, that's, who, <laughs> that's who you're engaging. And he just goes, like, again. <laughs> over and over again. As, as you practice your capoeira, or whatever it is that you're doing at the moment. Real. Ascending into the mind palace, and it's just, like, a sumo doyo. We're just God. both in the middle of being like, yeah, let's go. Yeah. Well, there you have it. Um, we're talking about Photomachus and his illustrious career as a Tulpomancer, a shadow assassin, <laughs> <laughs> martial artist. Um, this is, for those who don't know, Photomachus is a servitor slash sigil slash spirit. We're going to get into all of the history, um, or at least as much of it as we can about this spirit that was essentially created, discovered, you know, again, with, with a lot of these, like we saw in the DKM episode with Ellis, you know, a lot of these things get a little contested, but even by the people who initially are responsible for his creation, as it were. And he is a time manipulator, right? You know, he compresses time, makes it go faster, makes it go slower, and can be called very easily. And he's mimetic as well. You know, there's a certain virality to him that we're going to be exploring in great depth today. And of course, I am completely aware that me doing an episode on this is absolutely lending to that. And good riddance. I, I appreciate that. I, I want it to go out there. He dedicated the Cami episode to the, the first Great Wheel. And so we'll dedicate this one to our ever-reliable friend, uh, Mr. Mekis himself. So we're going to start with some basics. Uh, the writings of Fenwick Ryson, who is one of the original members of the crew that workshopped and created or discovered our main man. And something that you, Key, actually mentioned in the last episode is how a lot of these chaos magical writings are intentionally copy-wronged meaning that their authors mm -hmm. freely give permission, and I'm going to read this right from uh, Fenwick's website, freely give permission to copy, hack, splice, mangle, mutilate, spindle, twist, tear, or reprint the information as long as the copy wrong notice remains intact. So as such, when you're scouring the internet for information about Photomachus, you're going to encounter a lot of the very same important primary articles produced by Fenwick on many websites and in many languages. Like, all the stuff you can find absolutely for free on the internet, that's one of the things that I mentioned, you know, I find really beautiful about Chaos Magic. It's, uh, again, not a tradition I've ever really practiced extensively, not something I've ever involved myself with the way that you did. But this, I came across Photomachus through the internet through just, like, articles um, on blogs mm -hmm. that I was, like, looking into and eventually came to these very same writings and was like, okay, I'm going to give this a shot. Let's see if this works. Um, I, I'm, you know, I'm an undergrad at the time and I want to be uh, able to make certain classes go by faster and some other, you know, more downtime to be slower. And it worked. Like it consistently worked for me to the point that, like I said, this is the really the one um, artifact, if, if you will, of chaos magic that I actually practice regularly. And for the record about the other languages, like within like one Google search, I found Portuguese and German copies of all of Fenwick's uh, writings translated across a number of different forums and on Scribd. So, you know, I guarantee someone has pretty much translated this stuff into chaos magical groups in their country. It's that's one of the beautiful things about the whole copy wronging thing, which I, I really quite mm -hmm. like. I was just going to say, it's really nice for, you know, the rapid rise of techniques and very quickly sorting out what works from what doesn't mm -hmm. because everything's out there and, and everyone's like test my shit you know does it work does it not exactly 
So we're going to take a look at a few writings from Fenwick on Photomachus from the late 90s to get a sense of what the conditions for his creation, his discovery, his encounter, whatever you want to call it were, and how he was understood and conceived. So the following account that Key's going to read comes from Fenwick's 1997 article available on his website chaosmatrix.org, and it's called Photomachus, Viral Time Compression Slash Expansion Servitor. Photomachus was originally a sigil created in spring of 1996 when I was showing the Mad Prophet some sigilization techniques. So shout out to the guy's name being the Mad Prophet, very chaos magic. <laughs> shout out to Photomachus for having a birthday with me. <laughs> mm -hmm. The Mad Prophet kept the paper used for the demonstration and began using it when he was driving. The sigil's intent being to force time into compression. Reuben a friend of both me and the Mad Prophet, was brought in on this, and two people began directing energy at it. Photomechus crossed the sigil servitor line after both Reuben and the Mad Prophet attended a Metallica concert in Sacramento, at which Quinn is said to have smiled evilly when looking at the crowd and muttered to himself, Free Gnosis. Oh my Before, god. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> oh no, I wasn't ready. I, th listen, I, I know our synonyms are kind of goofy, but like, there's something so pure about this. There's something so pure that they're about to uh, quote unquote dump the energy. I know I'm spoiling, mm -hmm. like, of all of the Metallica concert into the sigil, which apparently birthed the spirit. But any anyway. And muttered, three gnosis. <laughs> before opening himself to channel and becoming a one-man mosh. On the drive back, both Reuben and the Mad Prophet dumped the excess energy into Photomechus and made it home in half the time it should have taken. I was informed and intrigued, and on the Death Valley pilgrimage, which was three days in a van with seven Chaos Mages, Photomechus was put to the test. Imagine the smell. <laughs> <laughs> I, will, I wasn't going to say it, but I was thinking it. <laughs> I literally have experienced a cross-country uh, road trip, like, from east to west coast with, a, like, a, a, not a van, but, like, an SUV full mm -hmm. of witches. And it was a lot. So I'm, oh, I'm yeah. you know, pot calling the kettle black here. But, yes, continue. <laughs> <laughs> the group directed a great amount of energy at him to help shorten that time to drive from Santa Rosa, which is north of San Francisco, to Death Valley. On the first leg of the trip, everyone looked at the clock before entering Vallejo. Fifteen minutes later, we had traveled almost 50 miles through the MacArthur Maze, which is the most dizzying interchange of highways known to man, in the Thanksgiving traffic. The second car with us, which we lost immediately preceding this, had continued to drive undaunted behind us. They never stopped. We wasted 45 minutes in Livermore before getting back on the road and coincidentally running into them again. There was only one side effect. The last three exits on I-5 before Bakersfield, which should have taken us 15 minutes to pass, took close to an hour. For the time compressed, time was expanded. For us, expanded on perhaps one of the most boring stretches of highway in all of California. At this point, Several of my friends and I sat down and did some work on Photomechus, making him a viral servitor. He could spawn copies of himself. We wired these together into a network so that if one compresses time but doesn't want to expand it, it passes off the duty for expansion to another Photomechus somewhere in the network. They all work together, and the more copies out there, the better it works. I find this idea of expansion and copying really fascinating mm -hmm. because what's saying is like at this point uh this sigil is now a spirit and that he works by duplicating himself anytime someone uses him or conjures the sigil a new form essentially of phenomicus is born uh or emanates forth and mm -hmm. they can share these tasks and they become kind of like uh, little nanobots, they become more and more powerful the more they are used because there's just more of them to go around and to offload duties to each other. Mm -hmm. it's, it's really interesting to note some of the overlap here with Alice from like the previous episode and, and the LS itself, where mm -hmm. in like kind of the most prolific uh, chaos magic spirits in terms of like how widely they're venerated have this inherent 
a mimetic quality to them and a desire to uh, spread themselves out for their own benefit. And it just kind of makes me wonder with this like intersection between the art of the copy wrong and spirits and so mm. like proliferating themselves like this, where they're like, yeah, as long as you're spreading it, do whatever you want with it. Yeah. And, you know, right after this account, Fenwick tells us that Photomechus was originally a sigil, which then became conscious and turned into a servitor. Uh, modifications were made to the original sigil to make it a viral servitor. So there was this original sigil, which we'll later hear was, was a mantra. It was a mantic sigil. And mm. there was then a copy that could have been printed. And then eventually it became this squiggly like pentagram within a square, which is within a circle, which is nestled in kind of like a stang, like wide, it's crooked, and it slithers down like a serpent terminating in a triangle with its um, the vertex pointing south. So I find it interesting, this idea that, you know, it was a sigil that became conscious, and then he had evolved past the state, started to function as a spirit. Um, potentially he was a spirit that was starting to increasingly interact with them more and attach his powers to the seal that they had constructed. Uh, potentially he was, you know, revealed. Um, I like the interplay of, of both options in the sense that, like, Fenwick and everyone was contributing greatly to birthing the spirit, but mm -hmm. perhaps like allowing someone who's, uh, you know, a, a cluster of shades or some incredibly good spirit at time bending or a, some other, you know, being of time to emanate forth a version of themselves that can be reborn through their creativity and through their efforts and through this seal. So, you know, obviously, like, none of us really know, like, this is not like a theology question of like, who really is Phenomicus, like, everyone's going to have their own particular experiences. At the end of the episode, we're going to look into some people's experiences directly with him and their conceptions of him or just their, uh, how they've used him and so on. And some people secretize him explicitly with certain deities, they see him as literally Hermes, or they see him as like, quite literally his own deity and so on. I, this, these questions are interesting. And, you know, we've all had our own individual understandings of him. I find more the technology and the inherent virality to be a bit more interesting to discuss, just because you can see how an combined effort is occurring here between the initial group of like chaos magicians who are working on him and the energies or the entities or the spirits plural or singular whatever you want to call them that are investing themselves in this and increasingly uh binding themselves to this project to enliven it at least that's the way that my animist mind thinks of this and you know i'm not saying it's not possible for you know a sigil to gain sentience i just what i but to me what that phrase means in my own practice since I, again my background is not chaos magic it's very much folk magic and witchcraft is spirits were attracted to this and start to animate it and then uh, agreed to give up whatever forms they had to enter this space or even impress their own forms and duties upon it. So, you know, who knows? Again, it's not really relevant. It's more that I find it interesting to think of just because, again, this was, this was the first uh, servitor, uh, you know, with a question mark. Uh, oh, that's not what I call him specifically. I prefer just spirit. But it's the first, you know, entity that you can say had some element of construction like this in a chaos magical framework that I ever worked with. And, you know, I have is still to this day the only one I've really done that with. You can actually find this latter sigil we described on any copy of this article online and in our episode image on Instagram. So the name of Photomechus itself is the original mantric sigil from which the seal was created. So it's forced time into compression Photomechus. In addition to focusing visually on the graphical sigil, Fenwick tells us that one can also focus auditorily by chanting this sigil. And here he's referring to a sigil as like the literal mantra of the syllables of his name. So it's Fota Mekus. Fenwick also gives us two sets of instructions for the use of the servitor sigil. The first is for what he describes as spawning and using a new copy, meaning that, again, like this whole, like the mini photomicus explosion, like the little fishes that are him everywhere, mm -hmm. uh, you conjure a photomicus to arise from the seal in some ways ex nihilo, and it, you know, appears before you and, and does what you need him to do. And this is uh, Fenwick's description of how to do this. Extend thine forefinger and by either drawing with a physical medium, or by tracing in the air in front of you, trace the sigil of Photomachus. Deckard Cain? <laughs> I, I had to go with it because of uh, 
extend thine forefinger. <laughs> yeah. It, it, it invites it. Ex extend thine forefinger. I, I, one, of my <laughs> uh, one of my favorite things about Chaos Magical Writings is it will go from like the the thou's thine donna robe do these things and then just randomly have like a very modern slang in those mm -hmm. structures or uh, later on just like and and then also like where like do this but then also bake cookies but with like a z at the end <laughs> we'll, we'll get to it but yeah thank you um thank you deckard uh continue <laughs> at the same time you oh no <laughs> 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 I <laughs> <laughs> okay, so <laughs> <laughs> at the same time you draw the sigil, you visualize a beam of octarine light shooting from your third eye to trace the sigil with your finger. It should leave an octarine copy of the sigil glowing where your finger inscribed it. Use Photomechus by focusing on the sigil before you, sending it as much or as little energy as you would like along with the intent to compress or expand time. And, as always, garbage in, garbage out principles apply. So give him the energy that he needs. Instruct Photomechus as to what he should do reciprocally with stretching or expanding time. For example, if he expands time for you, ask him to contract it the next time you drive somewhere. If you contracted time, ask him to expand it the next time you wake up, giving you more time to rise. Or the easiest thing to do is to ask him to pass off the expansion or the compression to another servitor in the viral chain, letting someone else who needs it use it. Then sit back and see what happens. I find this fascinating because the idea of having a photomicus arise anew as essentially like with the with the photomicus as a concept was like a greater being being the sum of its parts. Mm -hmm. And, you know, made up of any time that any magician calls him uh, is, I don't know, it's cool. I do, I do kind of see him as a collection of nanobots from this description. Mm -hmm. um, it's also not actually very much my experience with him in the sense that, like, when I've called him, it felt like tapping into the greater whole. And then, like, there was a, a version that was empowered through my tracing of the sigil. But there's also a, it doesn't feel like something new is arising from it. It feels like an instantiation of his power is being shown before me because I've called him for, so the the completion mm. of the task that I've set for him is that instantiation. And then the credit of that having been accomplished feeds the whole. So I, I hope you, you see the nuance of what I'm trying to say here. That's just yeah, my experience, yeah. you know, in terms of, it didn't feel like a new thing was being born. It felt like the, we were mutually convocating in, in the nature of my, my, my action, you know, my request, my petition. Mm -hmm. For the tracing, there's a demonstration of what this looks like, you know, in terms of like, what does it look like to kind of like wave your finger like that in that pattern and make it on uh, a channel by uh, a YouTuber called Fator Medo. It's at two minutes and 33 seconds on his Rituais Part 3 Photomecos Magia para Comprimir Expandir o Tempo. He has a fairly comedic style of presenting all his videos in like a deep mm. voice, like a Halloween skeleton mask, a jacket, like a leather jacket over his collar, shirt and tie. His channel isn't like solely about magic. It's also about like creepypastas, conspiracies and so on. It's like a little like the Portuguese Nexpo. But if you are a Portuguese speaker, it's a pretty funny summary of our, our timey wimey man. So I do recommend it. And the link will be in the show notes. The second method is for petitioning help from a distant Photomecus servitor. So this is, you know, in my mind, this is kind of like borrowing the currency magically of another success that was out there. Um, so in this case, you're calling an already conjured and realized copy of Photomecus. And I, I, again, like you can see, you can literally feel my amusement for, you know, the, I, the referring of like self-arising entities as copies. Like, it's just so funny to me. It's like very like techie <laughs> to do your mm -hmm. bidding from afar. And it's, and it's very simple. Step one, calm your mind for a moment. Step two, send out a call in your mind, asking for Photomecus to come and help you telling him briefly whether you need time expanded or compressed. Step three, continue doing what you were doing and see if it works. 
love the state it works. Uh, that's mm-hmm. that's my motto. And in this case, you know, some people, including Fenwick later on, actually says that like a lot of his experiences with Photomicus, um post the 90s were that he just shows up and helps him when he needs it without him asking for it. Like he just knows better than he does when he needs time compressed or expanded. And so I, this is kind of what that refers to for me. Like you already have some kind of established relationship with him. And now you're just instead of even without even drawing the seal, right? Like he's showing up. It's important to note here that when it says like it works, this we're not referring to mere illusions of time. Like, oh, you know, this it felt like it passed so quickly, but it really has been only 10 minutes, that kind of thing. Um, I mean, yes, that is how kind of how it works in function, but we're talking about time actually speeding up or slowing down. So in the sense that like some a task that takes you 30 minutes to do. And it's, it's like only physically capable of being performed within 30 minutes. So for example, editing mm-hmm. a video, like there's been many accounts on the internet where people are saying like, I was editing a video that's, let's like, let's say 15 minutes long. And I finished uh, the 15 minute long edit. It was not like fast forwarded. We were not playing at a times two speed or anything like that, but it only took seven minutes, that kind of thing. So there is a very literal dimension to the time bending here like yes there are plenty of situations in which like the lecture just flew by but then my time when i got home on my nintendo switch and was playing you know legend of zelda that that was so long even though it was actually an hour that kind of thing yes there are those perceptions but there's also very literally like something will actually slow something will actually speed up um which i Mm -hmm. i find has been a consistent part of people's explanations including my own and yours of what it means for you know see if it works Yeah, definitely. Like one of my favorite examples for uh, Photomechus' effect in terms of how it can be tested, excuse me, is driving. Because, you know, you have a clock and you have a speedometer right in front of you. And since distance is just rate times time, you can be like, for this to have physically been possible... I would have needed to be driving like 175 miles per hour. Mm-hmm. Yet, you know, you have both the the device that measures uh, rate and the device that measures time, and I guess a device that measures distance right in front of you. So, yeah, you can just be testing it. And I mean, you know, his whole origin story on that road trip points exactly to that. I always take the subway to go to work. So it's one of those things that I get to like in real time see, like I know what my commute is, you know, I know what what it's like give or take traffic um, or any other incidents on the subway. So that's like, it's really something when you see like, oh, that only took this amount of time and it really should have been like 60% more or even at times like, uh, you know, 95% more. Mm -hmm. So this is essentially like a mental petition or a prayer. Uh, personally, when I played around with Phenomicus, I've done the first method, right, of calling him to the sigil, and I've always kind of perceived this as a proof of pact between whoever it is responding to the, you know, petition to engage in the time betting magic to actually come forth and begin the work. I see the spirit arising out of the seal, or at times literally embodying it, floating in the air, and when I make my petition, uh, often accompanied by the mudras that we'll get into in a bit, I feel the sigil click and start spinning reality around it with everything either speeding up or slowing down accordingly. Like I always see it like set into the air in front of me and there's like a time dilation effect. It's it's a little bit like um in Star Wars when they go into hyperspace, you know, there's a little bit of like that feeling. And then um, sometimes this is also actually included sensations of clocks breaking as well as actual time displays in my home uh, flickering or pausing entirely. I've had to reset the microwave in the oven many times because I was using Photomicus uh, in the kitchen. But, you know, we'll get into our testimonies in a bit. For now, let's go on to the next ritual from Fenwick, which was written in the same year, and it's called the Photomicus Empowerment Rite. The introduction of this ritual is a little forward, which goes as follows. Photomicus is a historically recent addition to the pantheon of deities associated with time, the other major one of note being Kronos. Whereas Kronos is associated with the concept of time as fixed and immutable, Photomechus depends on the concept that time is fluid and malleable. It is because of Kronos' restrictions of freedom through the concept of fixed time that Photomechus has decided to wage a war on him. The following ritual is aimed at aiding Photomachus in the war against Kronos, and in gaining his favor through helping him. Because modern societies are completely dependent upon clock and currency, with time being equal to money, 
aiding Photomechus in destroying current conceptions of time can be considered one further step in the imminentization of the eschaton. I have a lot of thoughts, as mm -hmm. I'm sure you do, about this framing of Kronos as the god of fixed time, as this enemy, and, you know, Photomechus is the god of fluent time. What's interesting to note is that many, like Fenwick and many other people in his circle noticed when Photomachus became quote unquote conscious, like when he became like a, a spirit, as it were, would directly say, Kronos, your time has come, as like his declaration of war essentially against, uh, you know, this consensus reality, this consensus time, I suppose. And um, <laughs> one thing that, you know, it's fascinating because on the one hand, like, is this referring to like the Greek Kronos? I mean, given his mythology, maybe, but also... Uh, it, it's fascinating, you know, that the pantheon of these is associated with time and the other major one of no being Kronos, you know, which is funny because, like, that's not even the first time day that my brain goes to. And obviously, it depends on the traditions that you associate with. Like, my head goes to, like, Iroko Kitembo, you know, which is definitely yeah, right. not uh, fixed and immutable time, <laughs> you know, 100%, <laughs> very fluid, very malleable, much more a, a sacralized understanding of time. But I also don't necessarily inherently think that this applies to Kronos. Like, I know he gets a bad rap into mythology and all, but, like, I don't see him necessarily as this kind of like uh, Gnostic archon you know, that must be defeated <laughs> and, and is solely responsible for like the restraints of capitalist time upon our lives and upon our ability to create and, and have a fulfilling experiences with our time that isn't bound to, you know, the hard one through unions, you know, God bless them, but hard one, you know, uh, work week when it comes to like what qualifies as a full-time job i would say that nevertheless chronos is a, as a name here that is popularized you know in english through the greek and through pop culture seems to represent something that's uttered in the, the god like I, I know many people might say no no it's literally meant to be the deity but it seems to be a kind of deified version of capitalist under you know the restrictions mm -hmm. of time uh, upon because you'll see you know what is being referred to here in every other account that we see from Fenwick and many other people including those behind the Photomechus film project it's the dissatisfaction right with just the fact that you have to work your nine to five you have to commute you have to do your thing you don't have time for yourself you know you don't you're you're bound by certain schedules and certain deadlines it's not saying that like owing someone by a certain date is a bad thing it's not like saying that like literally the passage of time is a negative thing it's the squeezing of freedom and the itemization of our lives according to a very particular temporal regimen and i don't necessarily see the myth of chronos as culpable for that in any way in terms of mm -hmm. uh you know uh just the the post-industrial revolution experiences that we're all having however i see easily that chronos as a name can become the in some ways deification of this process so that that's just kind of like my mind spins always when i think of this idea of like photomechus at war with chronos because in my mind like chronos does not refer to the the greek deity it refers specifically to this concept mm -hmm. because that's how he's spoken about right 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 and i think there's you know something very the the zeitgeist of chaos magic at this time is deeply anti-capitalist Mm -hmm. and deeply martial in this uh, anti-capitalist organization mm -hmm. in terms of like everything is framed as a war that must be won against a particular set of generally or like highly regimented ordered principles as you were referencing and you know i think i think there's really something beautiful to that you know not mm -hmm. to invisible committee posts but it's like <laughs> the the value of the freedom to choose what to do with time even if that is nothing should be given a, a great priority in kind mm -hmm. of this this milieu so this is like a vector against this almost a uh, divine order that has come to dominate the lives of of most people living in this kind of set of conditions. So I I really am inclined to agree with you where I'm like, I a lot of people definitely do say, no, this is literally the Greek Kronos. Mm -hmm. But I'm like, there's there's more to it than that. Yeah. So definitely on on the same page as you. Mm -hmm. And about this ritual, 
it's basically a performance piece conducted by three magicians. One takes on the role of the drummer, uh, which is Vin Diesel. <laughs> One takes the role of the warrior, <laughs> which is Dwayne Rock Johnson. And then the chronomancer is, is last, which I'm, I don't know who else is in those movies. Uh, I apologize. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but I'm going to say, I'm gonna say it's, that's our boy, Photobigus. So it's either done alone as, as a group of these three individuals or before an audience. They uh, enter in silence into a dark place, clad as they see fit, uh, hopefully in flip-flops and board shorts. And the none are to wear, however, a timepiece, nor should there be one present in the working space. So I will just briefly summarize what happens. Essentially, the drummer has a drum, the chronomancer has a small digital clock, and the warrior has uh, a rock. Do you smell what the rock is cooking? <laughs> and, <laughs> and a roll of toy, sorry, and a roll of toy caps, or any other material that explodes when hit. So after a brief interaction in which the clock is shown to the drummer and the warrior, both confirm it as a suitable sacrifice, and the chronomancer raises the clock to the sky, presenting it before Photomachus and conjuring him with their thoughts, asking him to come and see the sacrifice that is being made to further his war against Kronos. So kind of like how he was fed a bunch of energy after the Metallica concert, right? The, the purpose of this is to continually feed him more energy so he can, you know, essentially revolutionize our society through fighting back against this archetype that we were just discussing. The audience should now visualize the Photomechus sigil and keep it in their minds for the duration of the ritual. The drummer begins to drum. The chronomancer visualizes all the negative things associated with time and it's, you know, the ways that it constricts us uh, living under capitalism represented by the clock, which directly is referred to as a cold calculating piece of machinery that measures off time as if it were a commodity with fixed value, a value determined in fact by the dollars for hours mentality of this trapped by this conception of time. And I think this perfectly illustrates what Key and I were just talking about. This like explicitly anti-capitalist nature and this martial understanding of you know the war the kind of revolution and i i'm deeply sympathetic to that and i really honestly kind of vibe with that it's my only hesitation was that the idea this is like literally chronos is to blame from like greek mythology which i don't necessarily see but i also understand that like this is part of the mythology right is that it, it literally photomachus was born to counter the older god it's it's kind of its own new it's like the, it's a new a new chaos comp right you know where the young gods rebel against the old gods and in this case it's the it's the new created slash discovered gods of chaos magic rebelling against an old order yeah definitely like there was some you know in in kind of preparation for this episode i was going through some discordian material uh-huh. from like way early on like the 60s like principia discordian stuff and like this this kind of same chaos conf uh motif is happening where it's like it's it's deeply framed as like a a chaos in like the the greek like primordia sense like kaos mm-hmm. against the order of the gods yeah so i'm like mm-mm. <laughs> So it, it's just to say, you know, this this idea, even among among this group or any subsequent groups, is like is far from new. It's just like this repeating, yeah. uh, over, like repeating over and over again, uh, mythology that is emergent from spirits just kind of posting. Yeah, and you know, as so as the group and the audience builds their disgust towards this concept of time, the drummer comes to see it as a replacement of his own art of drumming. For example, the warrior is ready to strike at it with a rock. The participants visualize the sacrifice as empowering Photomechus, and the warrior smashes it on top of the bed of caps to a great bang and flash of light as they explode beneath it. And, you know, in time, all the participants leave, the drummer slows, the magicians leave, and then the drummer is, is last to go as well. And they have like a little interaction with their facial expressions. It's a performance piece, right? And while mm-hmm. I'm not personally moved on by it, like on a personal level, emotively, as a ritual, you know, it is an interesting way of feeding a spirit who seeks to liberate us from these restrictions of time. I, it's interesting that it's not, you know, regular offerings of food, for example, right? It's offerings of energy, of time, of emotions, of feelings, of 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 the promise to use him, to call on him. One thing that's kind of interesting, the reason I even brought up this ritual in the first place is because it seems like this ritual was essentially performed, or at the very least mimicked to, you know, mimicked to a great degree, in the documentary J.R. Bob Dobbs and the Church of the Subgenius, which is available for free on Tubi TV. 
It's at about 45 minutes in exactly. So one volunteer, for example, has his watch smashed, and then everyone in the audience rushes the stage, taking their watches off and throwing them forward. So they can also be smashed over like a cinder block with a hammer. Uh, we'll put a link in the show notes, but it's really interesting. You might just go to 45 minutes directly, and you can see a, a quasi version of this ritual being performed. Yeah, it's definitely a fun watch. Like, go to the listeners, go check that out. It's very uh, interesting to see. And we literally found this kind of last minute when we were researching this episode. Mm -hmm. So, you know, what is time here that we have deadlines at all, that we can lose out on opportunities? You know, these are all parts of the sacrifice that we make in incarnate existence, right? But there's something much deeper here. And this uh, dissatisfaction with the ways for which we are strangled and suffocated of our ability to create and to enjoy our time under capitalism is really the heart of this war. Our final piece that we'll be reading from Fenwick is an essay which summarizes and explains many of these questions directly. We're going to read the majority of it because it's honestly quite important to give a better grounding as to not only the history of Photomechus as an entity, but also the philosophical understandings underpinning his creation. And we'll have some cuts just for the sake of brevity, but you can see the whole thing for yourself again on his website, Chaos Matrix, and uh, we'll have the links in our show notes on the Patreon. But it's called Don't Blame Me, Blame My Servitor, and it was written in 1998. I'm not sure whether I should be worried or not. You see, Kronos is a nice enough god of time, but he's a bit old, and I'm not sure he stands a chance against what's about to hit him. Of course, he has enslaved all of Western society to the clock, so maybe he deserves it, but yet I still feel kind of sorry for him. You see, it all started when I began playing with this idea of time magic. Not that I'm responsible for what's coming, mind you. I'll pass the blame off to Photomachus before anyone blames me. But I turned him loose a long time ago, and I take no responsibility for his actions. Especially with him ranting, Kronos, your time has come! Every time that I see him, and uh, perhaps I should explain. My own involvement with time magic was actually quite accidental. One day I got to thinking about time and how it flows, and how each hour is supposed to be the same length as all the others. Yet this never made sense to me. Sometimes an hour flies by as if minutes... Other times it drags on for ages. The end result of the thinking ran something like this. If we can use magic in any area of our lives, and if time is a mutable substance, then why can't we use magic to mess around with time? And thinking usually will get me into trouble sooner or later. So one afternoon running behind schedule, thought passed through my mind to use magic to speed up the journey. Listening to the radio as I drove down the highway, I created a suitable statement of intent. Force time into compression. Because driving doesn't lend itself well to artistic sigilization, I instead reduced it to a four syllable mantra that I could chant to radio music. Vota mechus, vota mechus. Despite little preparation, it worked exceptionally well, and I thought that, that would be the end of it. The next day, a good friend of mine, Quinn the Mad Prophet, uh, which don't ask, approached me and asked about sigilization techniques a la Austin Spare. Requiring a demonstration sigil, I chose to use uh, Photomechus, explaining the previous day's success with it. From the mantra, I created an artistic sigil that Quinn put in his wallet for future reference, inadvertently placing himself under its influence. Many stories of truly rapid transit followed, culminating in a Metallica concert where Quinn's goal was to Suck up all that free gnosis. <laughs> I don't know why I'm making oh. things sound like that, but okay. <laughs> Ooh, I want to get a lot of free gnosis at the Metallica concert. Mm, yeah, yes, the the gnosis of the of the Metallica concert. <laughs> 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 Fuck. All that free gnosis that Quinn sucked up was dumped into the Photomachus sigil to speed the trip home. And a two-hour journey took only 30 minutes. Even more surprising, the energy was enough to push the sigil over the border to servitorhood. I've used this technique before, of feeding a sigil enough gnosis until it created an independent servitor, but neither the Mad Prophet nor I had ever done it by accident. So without a home and nowhere to go, the Photomagus servitor, young and unintelligent, started following us around. Whenever we needed to compress or expand time, we would feed it a bit of gnosis and it would do the job. It started growing up as we fed it, growing a little more intelligent and a bit stronger each time we used it. 
we thought this good and well for the stronger he got, the better he did his job. And of course, this then goes immediately into an account of the Death Valley car trip. Mm -hmm. After several similar events, we mulled over various ideas to correct the problem of backlash and hit upon the idea of viral servitors. The key to a process of mutation that would allow Photomechus to eventually grow beyond our control. We worked several rituals in which we altered the sigil to make it possible for Photomechus to make copies of itself. These copies wired themselves into a network that made them incredibly effective at preventing unwanted side effects. If one of them needed to compress time and another to expand it, they would pass it off to each other through the viral network, maintaining balance and reducing the possibility of a backlash. Our only problem was that we didn't limit how large the network could grow. There was no check against it, nothing to keep it from getting out of our control. The only problem with a reproducing virus is that sooner or later it will mutate. It was about this time that news of Photomechus started spreading through the internet, and an online graphic of the sigil was printed out by many for personal use. Hundreds of copies were spawned, and the power of the Photomechus viral servitor network continued to grow. As the network grew, so did the power of Photomechus. The whole thing started acting less and less like a legion of independent servitors, and more like an individual entity, which I want to highlight as like how interesting that is. Yeah. Uh, at that moment where it's like that noting that that sequence, it after it spread only when it reached a certain point, it just kind of like coalesced into a single entity, mm -hmm. which uh, is some really cool stuff. I think I think there's something there that totally that I definitely want to bring up uh, after after the full quote. He started showing greater signs of intelligence. He would hold interesting conversations, show up when needed without request, and applied a greater precision in his use of time manipulation to get the most mileage from the least effort. It became obvious to the Mad Prophet and I that he was slipping out of our control, and it was about to become something else. The mutation had begun, and there was very little we could do to stop it. Over a year after his initial creation, he ceased to be a network of pieces and became more than the sum of his parts. His parts were still identifiable, but they were becoming less and less distinct. The viral network was now stronger than the individual servitors and looked more like a spirit in its own right with each passing day. The full mutation took place during the hour-long midnight to midnight, when Pacific Daylight Time becomes Pacific Standard Time uh, in October of 1997. Using mundane time expansion of an hour that didn't technically exist, we performed a ritual in his name that was designed to charge him with power for whatever use he saw fit. Seven people in one smash clock were the only witnesses to that ritual. For three days after, he just disappeared. Petitions for help went unanswered. Conversations were one-way talks with nothingness. Divination confirmed that yes, he was still alive, but no, he wasn't responding to anything. So we waited. And three days later, he rose from the dead, more changed than we had ever expected. Many chaos magicians speak of spirits as spanning a continuum of power, from the tiniest unintelligent servitor, to egregores of moderate power, to godforms capable of controlling entire cultures. In one popular theory, all godforms were at some time on the short end of the stick, and through constant use they amassed power, rose from servitor to egregore to full status as a godform. When asked how long this takes, many chaos shrug and guess that each step takes decades or even centuries. I would say that this grossly underestimates the potential for their growth. For when we next saw Photomechus, he was no longer a puny little servitor but an egregore powerful enough to shrug us off and make his own demands. One thing that this quote really illuminates for me is, and helps me understand my own struggles with some of this terminology, is that while Fenwick doesn't speak for every chaos magician, he is illustrating something here, which is that essentially all spirits can be categorized in, in these names, in these terms. So like God form can refer to any deity from any culture or any pantheon, servitor or egregore, uh, can refer to different layers of spirit interactability, as well as, mm, I would say, like, to a certain degree, like, publicness in the sense of, like, you know, is it 
like a saint or like a spirit that other people can call on or is it more like a private familiar that is just kind of your servitor you know do does it become an egregore more people believe in it or more people contribute energy or gnosis to you know which to me is a very funny term to use in this context given what it's meaning um you know it it that's uh, the martial nature of this is so gnostic like i'll be said intentional mm-hmm. right you know but like i just love the i kind of love it because a part of me is always going to love gnosticism to in the sense of like you know good old bogle mills and how they turned out the balkans like there's always gonna be a part of me that's gonna love that i Mm -hmm. i think reading this now i'm more coming to terms with the fact that like all spirits are categorized in this way for some of these guys so i'm trying to like in my my mind is like well you know photomakers could just be in a spirit you know that was attracted to the sigil or like a cluster of spirits that or shades of the dead or whatever that were good at doing this and lent their time and then got scrambled by some pre-existing time deity or force or whatever like that you know kind of like how spirit arises at the power of venus and can be attributed to different spirits of venus but you know ultimately is its own template and here you know this quote perfectly kind of illustrates that as like well maybe to these guys all spirits all deities follow this kind of creation and all of them depend to a certain degree on belief and on public recognition Mm -hmm. and that's how they gain their power i don't believe that spirits have power in relationship to belief or mass belief i believe it plays a role but you know i'm there are there are, the whole notion of spirit power and hierarchies is one that i'm very critical of in the sense that like you know uh, you can there are people out there who can work literal physical miracles with just their ancestors and there's people who packed with allegedly packed with every you know deity they can find and accomplish very little because they don't know how to supplicate and properly manage those kinds of pacts you know let alone it's not just like oh well you know this spirit trumps that spirit right but i do find it interesting the idea that like the virality of this spirit is baked into the system like he literally does Mm -hmm. grow an ability based on the virality and based on more people using him so in in his case like that is true like my familiars and your familiars you know they're not going to like grow in power if other people start working with them we don't want other people to work with them we want them to have relationships with us specifically because there's a certain level of camaraderie that we've agreed in this lifetime or at least for now to have mm-hmm. with them you know they're not meant to be shared uh, it's not like oh in a coven for example like the magistellus or like the main spirit that everyone shares you know is one thing like you know on the other hand spirits absolutely do gain power through more offerings right you know in the sense yeah. that like they are more rooted in this reality and can do more things there's a reason why like certain spirits that are seated in positions of authority in a temple uh, the temple version of that spirit will have a certain more oomph than your individual version of that spirit right you know when it comes to a particular entity and that is not because your spirit can't accomplish the same amount of things, it's that the other one has more authority and more needs like to respond to. Like he has to help the whole temple. He has to be able to respond to all this. So he needs more stuff in his vessel. He needs like more things to fuel him so he can do that job. It's kind of like, you know, I'm not more powerful than, let's say, some random person that's my friend, you know, socially speaking. But if I become their boss and I hire them, now I have power over them, right? You know, Mm -hmm. that doesn't mean as people we are not, you know, equal, but as colleagues or as members of the hierarchy of the job, we are not equal. And so that's kind of how I think about it is in terms of authority, in terms of what they need. And Photomeca specifically, it seems needs and, and grows through a virality of attention so that was a little long-winded but i hope you get what i mean like that's what i'm kind yeah. of struggling with sometimes with chaos magic and like because my perspective is and i try to be very flexible with it obviously because i'm not saying that like you know there isn't any worth to this but like i'm an animus through and through and i don't think in these terms necessarily but i do absolutely see how this is just another form of animism actually this is just it's just using different terminology you know mm-hmm. one of one of the things that um, I've, I've always had like a really fundamental disagreement with the kind of uh, cosmological underpinnings of how chaos magic addresses spirits is the uh, trappings that can occur where it's like deity equals big spirit. Yes, yes, yes. Mm-hmm. Um, which, you know, is in, in both of our experiences and I think kind of in most traditions, definitely not what's going on there so the view runs kind of contrarian to this understanding of it like yeah spirit can be like huge but it's not a god because it's not participating in a divine essence yeah 100 Mm percent and one of one of the things with uh photomechas that 
I, I've always kind of wondered about his, like, why is, is this virality the thing that fuels him more mm. than anything else? And one of the answers that I've, I've come up to in thinking about it, and I'm not, you know, saying this is right or wrong. I'm just kind of, kind of curious about what people would think about it is like, he's so martially positioned and in his kind of like declaration of war, as it were, he, he has positioned himself as like a spirit general. So what one could be doing by spreading his like sigil and making these like copies as it were of him are giving him soldiers. Like you are building him in terms of like a legion. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Absolutely. Oh, yeah. mm -hmm. But it's like, it, it kind of goes back to that, that idea of like, what do a lot of these spirits want? They want a body. Mm -hmm. And in his spreading of like physical seals, he's getting a body. Mm -hmm. So some, something to consider. Something to consider. <laughs> it's real. All right. I'll let you continue into our next block of this story. You got it. I still don't know what allowed him to cross that boundary. I suspect that when you give a servitor enough energy from enough different people, it will become an egregore, much as a sigil can become a servitor after being the recipient of strong gnosis. But similar egregores I had dealt with in the past had not been nearly as strong as Photomachus had become, though it shouldn't have been too much of a surprise. By this time, there were hundreds of people using him daily around the world, each of them feeding him a little more power with each use. Along with the ritual performed during the daylight savings time change, it was enough to push him over the border with change to spare. He re reintegrated the individual parts as his limbs, while the network became his mind. Granted, he wasn't a very strong egregore yet, but he had plans of his own at this point, and it would have been difficult for any one individual to control. Lucky for us, he was friendly, and wasn't about to take revenge for any perceived abuse suffered as a servitor. Instead, he showed up, let us know of his egregore hood and what was going on, and then faded into the background from where he would manipulate events. One could petition him in the same manner as before, but his skill at time manipulation had reached mastery. Oftentimes he showed up unrequested, giving help before we could even think to ask about it. There were even times when he was strong enough to get us to our destinations before we had left for them. Certainly not the work of a puny servitor. Admittedly, I'm very curious as to what Fenwick means by that. Yeah. I'm like, it was was he teleporting people around? Because if so, I'm I'm trying to hear about that. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Please call us um mm -hmm. and tell us that story. I don't see much of him anymore, but he does show up when I need him. He usually has a better idea of when I need him than I do. And sometimes he just drops by for a chat. At two AM sitting at a Denny's just a few weeks after attaining his Egregore hood. I had a particularly revealing conversation with him. Seems like he's not satisfied with being an Egregore. He wants to head for Godhood, and the only thing standing in his way is Kronos. Kronos, the god of fixed time. His talismans are the timepieces that control our daily existence. His clocks are the prison guards, to which we have become slaves. Never do we question his authority. But what could some upstart servitor with delusions of grandeur hope to offer? In my own case, my full-time job became a much more pleasant experience when I began to compress the entire day with his help. An eight-hour day feels like four or five, and this compression was fed back as expansion of my free time. A two-hour lounge around the house felt like three or four. If I needed more sleep, I would ask him to expand the nighttime hours, and I would awake after five hours as if I had slept in late. So much for those last nagging doubts in my head that time is fixed and immutable. In this way does Photomechus battle Kronos. We may be slaves to our clocks, but there is nothing to stop us from changing the flow of hours within those clocks. I find this really interesting how he's essentially begun to work on his own. And this includes having this relationship where he pops in and starts moving things along. According to an agenda that seems almost like almost like machine learning, except as a spirit, you know, like more encounters with more people asking him for help allows him to better navigate and expect uh, immediately what he's going to be called for, what he, where he might be needed for. It's interesting as, again, the virality of it is really cool, but it goes to show there's 
this ability for these individual photomicus you know entities to spawn out from these sigils go around and do their business and then rejoin and kind of like it, it strikes me as like an ant colony really is kind of how i see it like everyone you know the ants can lay down their scent trails which allows other ants to come forward and then lay down their own trails and then it moves the entirety of the colony over there and they move their queen with them Mm -hmm. Yeah, definitely. The kind of like social function of Photomechus as well. And I guess uh, Fenwick and like the original people's kind of seemingly resistance to it, as was shown throughout this kind of like excerpt where they're like, we were losing control. Like we couldn't, we couldn't keep them in the box anymore. I'm like, I'm kind of fascinated by that idea because it's like, I don't know, he's a spirit. He's just going to be doing his thing. Yeah, absolutely. But, yeah, I don't know. He is... It. There's something about the... As, as you kind of said, machine learning. The ability of an entity that is like so concerned with um, kind of atemporality and non-linear time. Mm -hmm. Predicting events may yeah. be like deeply related to this function in terms of like I don't know what is the the future to a spirit that doesn't care about uh, chronological order of future, past, and present, mm -hmm. and you know just this this engagement in nonlinear time. But there there's something as well to the stories as they're as they're presented, where I'm like, you know, I I simultaneously like and dislike this this metaphor of like, you know we're we're still inside the clock but the rate at which the hands turn is the mutable part it seems it seems like there there's more of a grandeur to what photomechus has going on to me especially if he's just like teleporting people around and doing this kind of weird shit mm -hmm. but just speculation as as to the function and functionality of of the spirit as he continues to <laughs> wage his war against against this linear time Mm-hmm. All right, and the last bit. At this point, I have a better relationship with him than I do with most gods that I work with. And he seems to like me. Occasionally, he pops up to tell me things to do for him, to get him out to more people, or to give him ammunition for his war against Kronos. In return for a little publicity here and there, he helps me stretch those hours around the clock to get the most out of them. He even pokes me and prods me to write essays about him so that others will use him. By using his name as a mantra or by creating a ritual using a sigil to call him, he grows stronger day by day. And new users feed him in return for his help. So sure, it may be neat to tell a story about how a servitor that Quinn and I accidentally created eventually ascended to Egregore Hood. But these days I feel more and more like I'm a servitor to Photomechus that he feeds candy for being a good little magician. An odd relationship at best. Photomechus has been out of my control for a very long time now. I do worry a little bit about his war with Kronos. I have absolutely no clue what he's got planned, and he's certainly not telling me. But to be perfectly honest, even if I am a bit worried, I've been enjoying the show. And with the millennium just around the corner, it looks like it's only going to get better. This is what the imminentization of the eschaton is all about. You can actually see an interview on Spiral Nature magazine with Fenwick Ryson on more of his understandings of chaos magic. We're going to move on for a little bit for now, but I think this provided a really nice summary for mm -hmm. the sort of intellectual conditions essentially underlying the Photomechus project and also this conception of him going rogue, as it, as it were, you know, having his own agenda, which to me, I'm just like, well, well yeah, he's a spirit. <laughs> <You know? laughs> but also, like, I completely get what Fenwick is saying here in the sense that, like, it feels like he midwifed him into reality, right? And mm -hmm. now he has this he has this role that of of in the one hand you know supporting him and wanting to uh, nurture his his you know promulgation, but at the same time feeling a little bit like you know constrained by that, but also liberated by his powers. It's, it's fascinating stuff. I am appreciative of, greatly of Fenwick writing all mm -hmm. this so that we can have access to it, so we can work with him and for his generosity of of what he's sharing. Yeah, definitely. Where I'm like, you know, as, as much as I can kind of disagree with his uh, takes about magic from time to time, I'm like, yeah, this is some good shit that he he kind of 
brought about question mark <laughs> bracketing that whole question of of what actually happened there mm -hmm. um and you know it's it's good as a whole that he's kind of propagated that which he has I mean, he did bring it about very literally mm -hmm. in the sense that not only did he create the original Montric sigil, but he also uh, put in the time, the effort, the hours, <laughs> you know, ironically, into spreading it, you know, mm -hmm. so it very much is his baby. So I always want to make sure that he gets the credit he richly deserves in terms of very much midwifing Photomecha's into reality. Uh, in addition, by the way, to growing viral as a sigil, <laughs> Photomecha's is also known for a movie project surrounding him that we mentioned before. It's known mm -hmm. as the Photomechus Film Magique. <laughs> That's mm -hmm. Magic with a J uh, project. And the movie itself was essentially a multimedia sorceress operation initiated in 2001. Greg Humphreys and Julian Vane, the authors of the book, Now That's What I Call Chaos Magic, uh, which dedicates a good portion of its pages to Photomechus and the film Magique project, refers to the entire thing as a film right. That's one word, uh, which I quite like. Mm -hmm. And as a quick aside, in the book, there's also a ritual called Time Consumption, or yet another Photomechus right, written by Fenwick Rison, which is literally baking cookies and sharing them with your friends. I'm a really big fan of that. I, I like a right where you bake cookies. <laughs> yeah, you know, uh, like you literally get a head cook who helps everyone get organized. You know, you bake sugar cookies, you have a party socialization aspect, and once everyone has one cookie on the tray for each participant, everyone impresses their clocks onto the cookies while saying, uh, you know, praise unto Photomechus, Kronos, your time has come. And the actual instruction published is uh, put the cookies in the oven and bake them with the Zeds. <laughs> <laughs> so in time, everyone channels as much spiritual power or gnosis as possible into a talisman of Photomechus, uh, which is basically like a piece of paper with a sigil on it, with and with one hand on the head cooks, who's covering the talisman with his hand, and the other on their own cookie. And so everyone says, Photomechus, come feed us, uh, which kind of rhymes. <laughs> and then everyone eats it after raising their cookie skyward saying, Photomechus, come feed me. It's like a little ridiculous. Like there, there's some real like Thelema cookies of light hours, <laughs> cakes of light hours, <laughs> except it's actually cookies that doesn't involve funny sauce. <laughs> but the best destruction is actually last, which is after everyone declares that they have become Photomechus, you know, warriors in this battle against Kronos, and, you know, being the idea that everyone can now alter some time on their own, uh, with or without the sigil, with greater ability than before, the individuals can then draw lots to see who gets to keep the talisman, and they can even rotate it between everyone. But the best part is literally that it just says you can glue a magnet to the talisman and put it on a fridge. <laughs> like, the, <laughs> ma the magnet is even part of the ingredients you need as a possibility. Like, I, I love that. Um, <laughs> it's just like, oh, if you don't want to, like, pass it around, put it on the fridge where you guys kept the eggs or whatever that went into the cookies. <laughs> I I love it. Any it's... amount of cooking juju I'm a huge fan of, and, you know, th this is just a fun way to do it. It is. It's, it's goofy to me. Um, mm -hmm. Because not, you know, obviously... Not that I haven't made a bunch of food offerings and hosted dinner parties with sorcerers, uh, you know, yourself always being there. Uh, mm -hmm. While we prepared offerings, had a communal meal, sometimes we even conduct seances after the very same dinner table, all cleaned up and we get dressed up. You're in a suit, uh, you know, salts in his beautiful waistcoat and everything like that. I'm in a dress. Uh, you know, gochujang caramel cookies may have been served even in the immediate aftermath. What I find mm -hmm. goofy, though, is the presentation of the ritual. Like, I would do so much more. If I was going to throw up, like, a Eucharistic communion dinner party for Photomechus, like, I would wash the cutlery and plates in certain waters. People would wear an emblem of the spirit. Like, the meal would include ingredients sympathetic to it and so on, you know. It's mm -hmm. cute. It's cute. It's just, uh, I just find that, like... <laughs> There's this, it's very tongue in cheek intentionally, right? So I'm gonna, get, but yeah. it is very cute. Keeman, aka Razor Smile, aka Dr. Matt Lee, an independent scholar at the Free University of Brighton, whose website hosts a video and who was an integral part of its production, gives an interview in the book on some of the intentions behind the film. He names three objectives, which I will summarize briefly. So the first is, and I'm quoting directly, to join the war against linear time, siding with Photomachus against Kronos, in order to aid in the liberation from temporal constraints, end quote. 
So this is a great description uh, of what you know linear time in some ways means. It plays into what we've already observed and extrapolated, that time is a habit baked into society. It's a destruction of spontaneity. It's an ordering of life to suppress and limit individual creativity and enforcement of this norm of the nine to five and the tyranny of factories, schools, and politics. So the other objectives are to provide a tactics of engagement in this battle by creating a kind of film as a magical ritual, making it a machine which promulgates these themes and inoculates them into the viewers, essentially viral propaganda. And finally, to create an object of beauty in service to what the author says is most beautiful of all, magic itself. Amen, brother. That was that made me very happy to read. Mm -hmm. He's a real one for that. He's a real one. The project was not just the film, it was everything around it too. So in order to synchronize everyone, three mudras or hand seals were developed to be able to call on Photomechus' powers. And these are the ones that I mentioned before. Like when I work with Photomechus, when I call him, I actually use these to, and uh, I don't think, I think I always use them actually. And I like them a lot. So the first is to slow time down. You still your mind and you chant Photomechus over and over again until Gnosis is attained. <laughs> I don't know, until you enter, I know, whatever, <laughs> until you enter a light trance state, whatever you want to call it, I'm sorry, the gnosis thing, it tickles me. Um, not how I would describe that, but, you know, respect. You then make the slow time mudra, this is done by extending your left arm forward and pointing it slightly downwards. Um, you use your right hand, palm downwards, and slowly draw uh, it across, or like rather along your left arm, as though you're stroking it, and you let your desire go. So you're kind of like petting your left arm to, you know, it's the, the top of it, uh, starting from the bottom. To make time speed up, you still your mind, you chant as before, you make the following mudra. Using your thumb, index, and forefingers of your right hand, you open these fingers out with your ring and little finger tucked into your palm. You bring your hand back so that your hand and its three extended fingers are by the side of your head on the same level as your eye. You then tense your arm and when you're ready, you fling it forward so that your right hand is fully extended and, and bring your fingers together again as though catching an insect and you let your desire go. I've done this so many times on the subway. I probably look a little nuts, but it really works. <laughs> <laughs> And then to reset time, again, you, you slow your mind, you call Pharamekas, you chant his name, and when you're ready, you put both hands on your forehead with your thumbs pointing upward, and you pull your hands away from your head as if you're pulling like something back, like a curtain, and then you bring your thumbs into the palms of each hand, and mentally or out loud, you thank Pharamekas for his help. A succinct summary of these mudras and some more musings can actually be found on the blog maintained by Julian Bain, one of the co-authors of this book, called The Blog of Baphomet. And the article is called The Magical Technology of Photomechus. Keeman and everyone else wanted to essentially give birth to Photomechus on a new level and capture this on film, which would be the art project itself. And they, he kind of like describes his intention as the following. The aim was to give birth to Photomechus through the film. Our plan to concentrate the Photomechus egregore into the one thing that it could not tolerate, a clock. Our intention is to create a focus and a road which will attract the Photomechus egregore and funnel its power into the timepiece. Then, as the clock is destroyed, so the light, that great definer of time, from the burning clock will enter the camera, expose the film, and thus the energy of the ritual will literally be captured on the stock. I was just going to say, that's kind of a cool description of like how you know photos can become magical links to people. Yeah, it is actually. I, I love that. There's an even more interesting description of this intention, which uh, Keeman also illustrates in this book. Our aim was to create the film, not as a passive viewing experience, but as a talismanic object, a portal through which the rituals that we worked would emerge onto the cinema screen. Our will was that the Photomechus film would itself be the climax of the ritual, and that the creation of the movie would be a pivotal step in moving Photomechus from Egregore to God status. By watching the film, which would be one element in a larger performance event, one would be tapping into the Photomechus energy. Showing the film would allow the meme viral servitor to reproduce in the consciousness of the viewer. Moreover, the viewer would be presented through the film itself with both the Photomechus current as raw experience and also with a series of techniques for working with that current. Watching this film means participation, not consumption. I am obsessed with that. Like, I really mm -hmm. love the idea of participation, not consumption. That tickles me completely. 
And I love the idea that you're not only rebirthing Photomachus onto a new stage, and essentially this is meant to kind of like deify him even more formally than before, but you're also actively inoculating yourself with the virtues of this current. Mm -hmm. Very, um, you know, I, I guess it technically chronologically predates the uh, DKMU, but uh, hyperstitionally. <laughs> Massive. <laughs> <laughs> We're gonna do the jungle is massive anytime hyperstitions are mentioned, anytime the CCRU and Nick Land is like even slightly in folk. Like this this is this is my new favorite meme. <laughs> but like the way that they conceptualize of like the mimetic quality of the media containing this this idea that propagates itself through the participants in the ritual who are now made participants simply through their, you know, interaction with the media itself uh, is something that I really uh, fuck with from like a magical application standpoint, mm -hmm. because I'm like, yeah, we can really get into it and like for force things to spread in this way and be empowered in this way, which we definitely no. talked about last week, but I was just going to say like, this, this is a really good application of, of that. It is. It, it's. It, I love the multimedia aspect of it. I love the emphasis on virality. I love the combination of like the internet and DVD and everything like that. And you know, the Photomechus Film Magic project is literally described as a sorcerer's operation, right? You know, and mm -hmm. however, on the website where you can view the trailer, which is razorsmile.org forward slash Photomechus, it says that the operation essentially produced a large amount of 16 millimeter film and video with an original intention of producing the film as a central magical artifact and charged object that would result from the operation. But money was needed and it was never quite there. And so the 60 millimeter rushes sit in his film fridge awaiting the day that he would be able to spare the 10 to $15,000 needed to finalize the print. And in the meantime, all those rushes were telesend onto video. A trailer was made, a picture cut, which is the video edit um, of the film was finalized, as well as a do documentary type accompaniment called chronomancy and these edits were finished and remain on a hard disk but in difference productions the business that was producing the film and providing the financial backing closed in 2006 and went to hibernation and so it was hoped that you know the film might be retrieved and a dvd could be made, uh, put together but more than a decade after the operation began you know unfortunately it has not yet materialized so either way you can see the initial cut uh which is about like 10 minutes long on razorsmile.org forward slash photomechus and it is really cool um it's definitely you can you can definitely see that they were like actively trying to enchant the process uh, mm -hmm. even on a very low budget with that said i now want to get into experiences so i went around uh, a few places on the internet like i didn't like want to literally grab absolutely every single take i just wanted a few different ones um in terms of what people are saying about their experiences calling Photomechus. Is he reliable? Is he dependable? Does it work? And overwhelmingly, the answer is a resounding yes. I have rarely seen people actually talk about, oh yeah, I tried it and it didn't really work for me too much. Like I've experienced, I mean, even the people that we asked directly um, in terms of like, what are your experiences with Photomechus? Overwhelmingly, just absolutely, it works and it keeps getting better. Like, it, like I've noticed as well in my experiences with him is that like with time, haha, it literally just he continues to evolve and furthermore um i've even i've like sigilized him i put him on cards i have distributed him around you know i've literally <laughs> i've like gone to the point of like creating mini shrines for him and stuff like that and it just seems that any amount of attention works like there's there's nothing that really He's not the type, it seems, to just kind of like give you recipes for things to do. He just wants to be called. And he has a pretty laid back personality. I didn't quite see him as this kind of like, uh, you know, megalomaniac in any, in any way. Like he he was he was pretty laid back, but he also is quite um, excited to be put to work. Like he wants to prove his power and he seems to like want to be engaged with on a very deep level. So I have a few quotes from people. The first comes to us from a, or the first three actually comes to us from a thread on r slash chaos magic on Reddit. And this comes from Jay Donchild, if you would, if you wouldn't mind reading Key. Mm -hmm. I've done this twice before. It works amazing, but the cooldown period can be a real drag unless you account for that and you're working. I wanted to make the long commute time heading to a vacation spot pass quicker. 
but I didn't specify how I wanted the time to pass once I had arrived. The commute went quick, but every single time I had to wait in line for anything at all while vacationing felt like hours. The commute home was slower and settling back into normal sucked. It ruined my vacation, but after consulting with a few friends who'd used this particular time magic method for years, I learned that I hadn't done it correctly. I've used it once successfully since then, and I haven't done it after that. It worked amazingly, but my ADHD brain has enough issues with time management already. <laughs> <laughs> that next one comes from seeker seeking underscore one from the same thread. And he says, I only recently learned about him, and I made a quick copy of his sigil and a post-it that I put on the wall at work. Holy wow, it is fun to make us work. And I mean right away. I asked him to make the work hours go quicker and the leisure hours slower. And by the end of the day, I was just in awe of his powers. That is literally, I think, what I first started mm -hmm. using him for. One was to catch the bus or the subway train, wherever I was taking. Uh, for like, I wanted to line up with like the, I have to transfer a few times, right? So I wanted to be at the station right where it like, stops and lets me on for it to depart quickly and for me to get to the next one right as it's leaving so I can like get it on immediately. And the same thing, and then to be there early, but then for my tasks to pass per quickly. <laughs> <laughs> um, and then for my leisure time to be expanded. Like, literally, this is exactly what I was using him for. In fact, uh, that's also what this guy, Waters-Serenade, also from the Chaos Magic thread on Reddit, says. This guy got me out of Latin class regularly, lol. <laughs> King. King. This, this person gets it because the main thing that I have gone to Photomechas for in the past mm -hmm. was... Uh, when I was in school and for everything when I was in school. Yeah, because you were like, I don't want to go to a redacted subject that you specialized in. I want to go play League of Legends. <laughs> yeah, uh, to the, the listeners, I was the guy playing Hearthstone in the front row of the lecture hall. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you were you were pumping iron at the gym and then also watching like the international league of legends splits or whatever <laughs> on twitch oh, i i know the story you're referencing and oh no yeah <laughs> but Amicus was involved he, yeah he carried with, me through. With, with the what was it the two liters of cold brew coffee yeah yeah oh man you're a monkey that <laughs> you're a creature yeah the 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 redacted version of the whole story is I locked myself in a laundry room of the uh, student flats at the university and drank about two liters of cold brew coffee, then did a semester's worth of programming homework in like one day. <laughs> because you procrastinated by playing League of Legends. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you. Big <laughs> love. <laughs> Massive. Massive. <laughs> yeah, that's 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 the love that you know we insult share. Massive. Massive. So our next uh, person is from our Sasha Call on Reddit. Uh, Wisnimi uh, says, "Has Fudamek has always been this good? I remember a handful of years ago trying to shrink my workday, and it was so and so. But last night." Okay, so I ask for a long sleep and a short working day. I go to sleep around 23, uh, so that's 11, and wake up rested and it's only 2.50. Walk back to sleep, wake up again, feeling like I've just had a proper long lie and it's 6 in the morning. Back to sleep and now what it feels like for a good full hour is, you know, full dreams and everything long, but I'm woken up by an alarm at 7. Then the day, the eight hour workday felt like five. My half hour lunch felt like a full hour. I spent 15 minutes typing this and it's actually only been five. This is what I was referring to earlier. Like, it, you know, he spends 15 minutes typing, but it's only been five. Like that's with like the video editing stuff, right? It's like, I mean, mm -hmm. um, <clears throat> have have called on him many a time while editing uh, our podcast, actually. <laughs> <laughs> From the same thread, we have the Idiot Prince, great username. And he says... I adore Photomechus. He always helps me out when I need him. It really takes a shine to you if you just bust some clocks. I go out into the woods, carve a sigil into clocks, and just bust the shit out of them with a hammer. I mean, so did those guys in that documentary. I, uh, yes, first of all, King also. Um, but this reminds me, kind of off topic, kind of on topic. My The first time I ever tried to like, bind someone, as it were, 
<laughs> you know, mm-hmm. like I was like a preteen and I took this person's photo from the yearbook and I put it in a broken wristwatch that I had and I, I bound it with thread and like muttered all this shit over it and then literally buried it at a crossroads where I knew there were plenty of car crashes and that got this person kicked the hell out of my school. I love it. It's one of my favorite magic stories, especially given like just every, everything about it is chef's keys. <laughs> but I think that the best part is that I was 12. <laughs> yeah, exactly. That, that is the best part. Yeah. No, I was, I was, uh, I was, it wasn't that bad to be honest. Like, you know what I mean? Like it, mm. I, I hadn't even literally learned uh, a system of magic at the time. I just, I just kind of was like, what can I do? And oh yeah. And the other part of it too is I, I, it was her yearbook photo and it was also the hair that I clipped from a brush. Oh yeah. Mm-hmm. Got to watch out for the brush. Slip. Yeah. It's the classic. The classic slipper room. Yeah. <laughs> mm-hmm. That is a really oh. good one though. There's a, uh... I, I really do like this thing going on with Photomechas where one of the primary means of empowerment is the destruction of the idols of his opposing god. Yeah, that's pretty sick. It, it reminds me of, um, you know, in the PGM where you have to like bind a deity or kind of offend them by essentially doing something that pisses them off. And then you do the mm-hmm. binding to be like, don't be mad. And it's like literally the Oracle of Kronos. Right, which is a PGM ritual that I did that we referenced in the episode two, the exorcism and antiquity. Mm-hmm. Involves you, you know, putting salt through a mill and grinding it over grass, which is obviously a way to kill its fertility, which fucks with Kronos as an agricultural deity. And when he shows up, you present the phylactery and calm him down and so on. Like, the, I don't know, it's it's freaking, it's cool. <laughs> yeah, definitely. Pulvis et Umbrosimus from our slash call on Reddit says, I left my apartment 30 minutes before I needed to be uptown, a 40-minute commute at that time of day in New York City. Arriving at the subway, I got there just in time to watch my train depart. Panicked, I began to do the spell. The next train arrived within a few minutes of starting. I managed to grab an express at the next station, and when I got to the next hub, I had to wait a few more minutes for the next train. I never stopped touching the coin or repeating the name. Uh, I'm reading like a further into the post, but uh, he mentions that he traces the sigil on a five cent coin and he uses five specifically for photomechas. I boarded the next train and took it two stops to my final connection, only to find that the train was six minutes away. Knowing without looking that I did not have the time to wait, I ran upstairs and was immediately presented with a cab. He took me the remaining 20 blocks to my destination in the next five minutes. The total cab fare was $5.55, under a repetition of the five theme. When I looked down for the first time to check my status, I had made it 10 minutes ahead of schedule, giving me time to have a cigarette and regain composure before my meeting. If my math was right, I made the 40-minute commute in 20 minutes, including time I spent waiting in train stations. So it's 15 minutes total travel time, maybe less. I was speechless with a huge fucking grin on my face. I have had this exact experience, minus the cab, um, to a T, basically. And like I said, mm-hmm. one of the main things I used for is for subways when I was commuting uh, constantly, especially before the pandemic, like pretty much consistently to work this way. And right before I went remote, like this was literally pretty much like every single day I would be calling Photomeca. So if I was already, um, if, if it was a chance of me missing something or if, if I was already there and everything was kind of working, that's fine. But if it wasn't, like I would be doing this technique. Yeah, for sure. Like, have have similarly had parallels with the trains, especially. Mm-hmm. Um, one of the uh, things that I used to do was when I needed to get to the airport, mm-hmm. there is a, in the city in which I live, there's a train line that runs from roughly near where I live, like directly to the airport. And, you know, needing to get there obviously before flights have have it takes about an hour uh have shown up at the airport like 10 minutes before a flight gotten through security and got on the plane after taking this train thanks to uh mr meccas so Mm -hmm. it is it is very good but of course with every use comes the you know with every contraction comes the expansion right Mm mm-hmm and Anon from the X Board of 4chan says, <laughs> I think I'm getting the backlash from it now. I've been shitposting on 4chan for what seems like ages, but it's only been half an hour. <laughs> I love your accents. 
Yeah. So of course there is also an expansion, right? You know, and mm -hmm. I've tried to indicate to Photomechus, like this is this is when you can release the pump, please. <laughs> you know, this is when you can dial down the vial or the valve rather. <laughs> <laughs> But, you know, sometimes it just happens and you get a little wobbly. Yeah, definitely. He's getting there. He's practicing. He's practicing. <laughs> he's honing his katana, folding it, you know, 3,000 times. <laughs> mm -hmm. He's he's dueling, sparring in the mental arena with uh, Vin Diesel and The Rock. Yes, yes, his, yeah, exactly. Uh... In the Matrix room. <laughs> yeah, for his war against girls. <laughs> And uh, finally, we asked one of uh, our good friends, Megan from Kitchen Toad, about his experiences with Photomachus, and he gave us a wonderful account, which I will read. He says, in regards to Mr. Mechus, I didn't play around with Photomachus for too long, about six months prior to the pandemic up here, but I was using the sigil pretty much every day for a while, and it led to some pretty whack consequences, and my notion of time it took a good few years to get back to normal. I was essentially using him to dilate time outside of work and shrink the time spent at work, which at first made it feel like my eight to 10 hour shifts lasted three hours, but the time outside of work felt like it was lasting multiple days, even if I only had about 16 hours between shifts. But I had really good luck with getting to places on time, lights turning green at the right time, etc. Everything to essentially make it so I didn't waste any time. But then night would also feel like it was insanely drawn out. I had a hard time sleeping because time felt so large that I'd sleep about an hour or two and I feel like I'd been the whole night. When I first started working with him, I usually just drew a sigil on a piece of paper, made my intention clear, and then visualized the sigil while intoning a name, usually while walking rhythmically. But I also played around with smashing clocks and those cheap plastic watch faces that I draw his sigil on. And that's kind of when the time dilation got a little too effective, and essentially made me feel like I was in a sensory deprivation chamber when I was alone at home. So I would say A plus spirit slash construct to work with if you're like taking a long train ride or if you need extra time on a vacation. But dilating time that isn't filled with anything in my experience felt like being locked in a time loop. It made me very uneasy. I love the man, though. Thank you, Mai, for giving us this review. Mm -hmm. And yeah, when we're all hanging out at my house uh, next time, we got to practice some Mr. Mecca's stuff. Because I'd love to see what happens when all of us get up to some fun with, with him. I think uh, one part of Megan's story that really... Um, I, I, you know, not, I, mean, I relate to all of it, but I also, I think it's that specific idea of feeling like it was a little too effective at times because the time loop is kind of real, like in the sense of like, okay, work is passing by super quickly. I get to sleep for a long period of time. Oh wait, no, it's not sleep. You know, and I'm already somebody who has a very um, difficult relationship with the sleep schedule as it were, <laughs> given <laughs> the practices that I do being very nocturnal. And so when I, I noticed that when I was doing a lot of work with Photomicus, I would be like, oh, I'm fine. I slept so long. And like, it actually wasn't a healthy amount of sleep. Mm -hmm. But I don't work with him every day in this way. It's one thing if I'm commuting, it's another thing if I'm kind of more at home. So, but I do ask him to help me with managing sort of like my time with writing with you know kind of tunnel visioning and stuff like that i have i have literally microdosed mushrooms <laughs> while conjuring and this is like the most chaos thing <laughs> i've ever said in my life <laughs> <laughs> but you know it uh and the time dilation stuff worked really well like it seemed to i mean obviously because it was the physical effect of the actual like time bending plus uh you know because i love mushrooms very much you know plus the feeling of the focus that microdosing brings me, mm -hmm. which I don't do very often, but when I was, it was just something like, it was just, I had deadlines and I was writing a lot and it made it go by like that. You know, not only was I focused, but it, I literally wrote an inhuman amount of words in such a short time span. Like there's like, I'm a pretty quick writer, but there's no way I could write that much in only two hours. Yeah. You know? Especially because I did take breaks. Like I literally did. I remember like tapping through some, you know, things on my on my browser. I was doing some other stuff. Like it actually was quite remarkable. And I find that to be, yeah, I, you know, I highly recommend him. I hope that people listening, uh, if you've never heard of him or never worked with him before, give it a try. Like let us know. Uh, you know, DM me, Dragon Cunning on Instagram, uh, message us, you know, on our contact form on withcuttingandcommand.com. Uh, if you're one of our lovely patrons, please do send us in a, a, me a message on our Q and A every month about Photomecas. We want to hear your we want to hear your ideas, your experiences, because he's fascinating and he's very easy to work with, and he thrives on being worked with. So this is one of those things mm -hmm. where like you won't uh, you know be respectful, be polite, be help, be courteous, but he's not offended by you asking 
him for help frequently. You know, like he actively thrives on that and seems to grow in his abilities, frankly, in his experiences of doing this. Yeah, definitely. Like he is a, a very good candidate for experimentation with a particular spirit, especially in terms of what you can do uh, magically with and through him. Because, you know, like you said, easy to work with, doesn't really get offended and likes to do weird new shit that happens to be very easily testable. Yeah. Yeah, it's like we were talking about with like whether magic is really easily testable, right? It either rains or it doesn't when you did a spell. In that way, it, you either like catch the bus or you don't. Like things either mm -hmm. slow down and speed up and you can check your watch and realize, you know, or your phone or whatever like that and see how much time has actually passed versus how much were you physically able to accomplish? Like, were you able to half uh, commute in rush hour in New York City? Were you able to... Uh, you know, drive a ridiculous amount of miles <laughs> in a time span mm -hmm. that is literally Im physically impossible for you to do. Like, was there a time distortion that is not merely an illusion of your perception of time? You know, because it works or it doesn't. And sometimes it doesn't work because there's other factors in play that make these conditions uh, less easy to move. But I found that Photomechus truly can just kind of like do some pretty nuts things. Like that's one of the reasons I was drawn to him was seeing discussions of his use on the internet and being like coming across the blog of Aphame's post on him. That was really like my first encounter. Uh, eventually reading Fenwick stuff and then being like, I gotta try this. Like what's, you know, what's the worst that could happen? And I'm really glad that I did. Like I, I love Fenwick's ability to just uh, get you where you need to go uh, mentally, spiritually, physically. And I look forward to seeing uh, what people get up to him uh, in terms of like, what 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 do you need? But we all could use a bit more time. So like, what, what would you use yours with when it comes mm -hmm. to working with him? I will say uh, very easy to tag his sigil in places, very easy to recommend him to people. This episode itself is a kind of offering to him. And uh, a huge shout out and thank you to everyone who ever posted, including just random shit posts on 4chan <laughs> and Reddit, uh, their experiences. There's plenty more. You can find all sorts of places on the internet. Um, plenty of threads every now and then pop up about him in various spaces, including on Tumblr. Definitely, like, when I Googled him around, like, I saw many things. These are just the, the selections that I decided to provide. But if you're interested in getting to know more, there's you will never find yourself short on materials for him, <laughs> especially mm -hmm. uh, given the, not just the promulgation of Fenwick's writings on it, but, like, the amount of people who have their own ideas and theories, uh, which hopefully, you know, you will feel comfortable one day contributing to. So thank you all so much for listening. Deeply appreciate, as always, your patronage and your thoughts and your feedback and all of your wonderful support for this show. It means a great deal. Next time, Salt will be back. So look forward to our amazing, wonderful Exorcist co-host uh, extraordinaire will at last turn from his journey uh, to help us uh, mm -hmm. go into a very fun topic that is in, in the vein of Photomechus and DKMU, uh, very experimental, but not having to do with chaos magic. You can find us on twitter.com forward slash Frightful Howls, and you can support us on patreon.com forward slash The Frightful Howls. Get Salt's Awesome Almanac, be able to contribute your questions to our monthly Q&As where we answer pretty much anything that you're interested in tossing at us, including giving advice on magic, on all manner of other spirit experiences, and also just the episodes themselves, as well as some personal details about ourselves. And you can also get our awesome plant worksheets that come with the Almanac. You can get in on the episode suggestions as well as our awesome show notes and plenty more to come. And with that, my Akashic record of the day is still by Acid Arab. I listened to this pretty much on loop while doing the research. I love putting on Acid Arab when I'm just kind of like mm -hmm. vibing and working. He's got some really great tracks and I was absolutely just pumping this the entire time. Hell yeah. Love some acid Arab. Very, very good to just put on vibe, like you were saying, you know. It's mm -hmm. like, it's music that can match anyone's vibe. <laughs> Indeed. And uh, my Akashic record of the day today is uh, Yellow Claw presents Eurotrash. The art of Eurotrash. That's not just a record. That's an entire set where three guys maintain character for like half an hour of a mix <laughs> and they look like the council of vampires from like one of the twilight movies like i've never seen the twilight movies but i know the meme of them like staring down from a balcony looking all posh like they mm -hmm. literally dress like those guys and just eat cake uh flip through a bible pour each other champagne 
<laughs> and just like glare at the audience while DJing. It's <laughs> amazing. It's perfect. The mix is fire. And uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm very glad you suggested it. Yeah, that's great. It's like the looking out on the audience with the opera glasses just yes. frowning is it's perfection. The it whole is. music video is perfect. It is. And you can really see <laughs> how my and Key's like <laughs> music taste is truly eclectic with a capital E. <laughs> <laughs> oh, legit, man. So it's, it's across the board. We we have some deep cuts in the the halls of the Akashic Records. Mm-hmm. And our license to depart, very cheeky, is literally the actual license to depart dismissal from the Oracle of Kronos. <laughs> P PGM 4, 3086-3124. This is the one that I performed, that I wrote a blog post about. Mm -hmm. uh, <laughs> I, I, I love how cheeky it is to include this. It wasn't even my suggestion, it was Keys, by the way. <laughs> yeah, legit. I was like, hmm, <laughs> very cheeky. Very and you know, cheeky. I was I always love to bring attention to uh, that post because I definitely think it's one of the one of the best on the entire blog. Thank you, thank you. I really appreciate mm -hmm. that. It was awesome and you've seen the phylactery and you've seen a glow. Mm hmm I I was pretty shook when when I saw it for the first time, not gonna lie. <laughs> and I'm like, oh yeah, that's that's cooking. It's cooking. Mm-hmm. All right, give us just the English part. You don't have to do the, <laughs> you know, <laughs> the yeah. the uh, vowels <laughs> and the, the barbarous <laughs> words and names. Like the the Anaya. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, okay, so here's the English portion of yeah. the uh, dismissal. Hell yeah. Go away, master of the world, forefather. Go to your own places in order that the universe be maintained. Be gracious to us, Lord.